Thoughts on Sustainable Development. I'm going to ask our moderator, Phoebe Condori, to connect her camera and microphone. Phoebe is a professor at the School of Economics at the Athens University of Economics and Business in Greece. And she's going to be our moderator for this panel on multilateral financing of the SDGs, African and Asian experiences. Thanks, Phoebe. Thank you very much, Lauren. It is truly a pleasure to moderate this plenary session. I should add that I am also a co-chair of SDSN Greece, and I am delighted to be working in the amazing network that Jeff Sachs and the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network has put together to mobilize the world towards a sustainable future. These days, I always uh, start my presentations with uh, uh, an indication of how I see the challenges that we are currently facing. And obviously, we are facing the big tsunami coming from COVID-19, the health pandemic, costing lives all over the world. But we are also facing a big, uh, a, an even bigger pandemic um, deriving from the uh, health pandemic, which is the economic recession that is coming due to the health crisis. And of course, we are also facing a third tsunami, one that we've been warning about for many years, and we've been feeling its effect, climate change. At the same time, we are also uh, facing a sleeping elephant, increasing an aging world population. So these are difficult and challenging times. And today we are going to be talking about multilateral financing of the SDGs. And we are going to focus specifically on African and Asian experiences. We all know that uh, in 2015, uh, Agenda 2030 of the United Nations was signed by 193 uh, countries. And uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, since then, the Sustainable Development Goal are our blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. They address the global challenges we face including poverty, inequality, climate change, environmental degradation, peace, and justice. Since uh, the signature of 2015 SDGs, we had the uh, Paris Climate Agreement trying uh, to uh, find a way to limit temperature below 2 degrees Celsius, the increase in temperature below 2 degrees Celsius. We also had in 2018 IPCC warning that this, uh, we need to limit the increase in, in temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We also had in 2019 the amazing uh, initiative leadership of the European Union and the European Green Deal, which uh, puts uh, as the axis of our new growth strategy, climate neutrality by 2050, clean tech leadership, and of course, a transition to sustainability that will leave no one behind. Since uh, then, there are other uh, new deals, green new deals that are being drafted and will be announced very soon. Unfortunately, early 2020, we had the pandemic, we had uh, this uh, amazing uh, situation where uh, we know that flattening the infection curve steepens the microeconomic uh, recession. And because of that, many national and multinational multilateral organizations have put together uh, recovery plans uh, financed uh, by public debt in order to face the current uh, crisis. The EU has won the recovery plan the next generation. The G20 signed a debt memorandum, United Nations Global Framework for the Immediate Social 
economic response to COVID-19 and many others. It is true that uh, COVID-19 demands a bold multilateral response. The COVID crisis only strengthens the call for a new multilateralism in which global rules are calibra calibrated towards overreaching goals of social and economic stability, shared prosperity, and environmental sustainability. Reviewing, however, the global trends and the current situations, one realizes that the resources for multilateral development cooperation are growing, but simply increasing the volumes of funding will not be enough to deliver Agenda 2030. And given this gap, I would like now to turn it to our speakers uh, in order to investigate how uh, we can um, mobilize this uh, needed funding for the SDGs, how multilateral financing for the SDGs can uh, truly um, uh, support a just transition, an inclusive transition to sustainable development. Our first speaker is uh, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, an incredible strength that mobilizes this sustainability transition in all five continents. I guess you all know that Jeff is uh, the president of uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University founder and board chair of the Millennium Promise Alliance and a special advisor to UN Secretary General. Jeff, sorry for speaking too long. The floor is yours. Phoebe, thank you very much. Thanks for everything you're doing to help lead this effort and thanks for moderating this session. I, I'll try to set out a, a general framework in just a few minutes for the purposes of our discussion. We have 17 goals uh, for the sustainable development goals. Uh, I think it's useful to put them into six major transformations. Each one of those transformations requires massive investment. Uh, then the question of financing is how to finance those particular investments. So the six transformations as uh, I see them uh, are first, uh, the development of human capital and skills, uh, that is education, research, and development. In SDG 4, there is the commitment for every child on the planet uh, to achieve at least an upper secondary education. Uh, in SDG 9, there is a commitment for all governments to be part of the global technological advancement. So transformation number one is about skills and innovation. Transformation number two is about health, something that is obviously uh, essential uh, for survival and poignantly so in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, SDG three calls for universal health coverage. And when we see the gaps right now, we see the lives lost as a result of that. The third transformation that I would emphasize is towards clean energy and industry. SDG 13 and SDG 7 are about the transformation from fossil fuels, which are polluting and emit uh, carbon dioxide, uh, the most uh, important greenhouse gas, climate change and greenhouse gas, to uh, zero carbon energy, especially wind and solar power, hydro, geothermal, uh, and uh, other uh, net zero carbon uh, forms of primary energy. Uh, so that's part of the clean energy and industry. SDG 12 calls for circular economy, which 
uh, means that we stop the massive pollution of uh, plastics uh, and toxic chemicals uh, and air pollutants uh, around the world. So this is uh, the third major transformation. The fourth major transformation is to sustainable land use. Uh, that involves more than anything setting boundaries, actually, uh, to stop the uh, continued encroachment of uh, farm activity, for example, into rainforest regions, uh, something that is leading to massive destruction of the major tropical rainforests. Uh, it also means other conservation measures to protect biodiversity and major biomes. The fifth transformation is to sustainable cities, uh, because we are not only a uh, dominant urban uh, global uh, society now with about 55% of human beings in cities by the UN measure and by some measures already up to 70% if you take a, a different definition of uh, urbanization. But the cities are expanding rapidly in population. And this will, I think, accelerate as agriculture becomes uh, even increasingly mechanized in the years ahead. Well, the cities need infrastructure. They need transport, power, water, sewerage, and the uh, social services of health and education and so forth. That's a lot of investment in new cities. And the sixth area of transformation is what is dramatically underway this year, and that is the digitalization of the world. We were in the great digital age already, uh, like the steam age or the age of electrification. Now we're in the digital age, where the advances of all digital technologies in computation uh, <coughs> and connectivity uh, are changing lives, uh, changing how we live, changing how we work. And uh, we understand more than ever, especially with COVID-19, that we need universal access to meaningful digital services, uh, whether it's online schooling or healthcare or e-governance uh, and other services. Well, you put all of this together, education, health, energy, land use, urbanization, and uh, digital, you can see this is a major investment effort over the next generation. But each one of these investments has particular characteristics. For example, the education investments are largely public sector investments. They are financed through budgets, government budgets. Uh, similarly, the healthcare, uh, the second transformation, is largely a public service. When it comes to energy, that is a mixed public private activity. Some parts of the energy system are public investments, uh, a lot of the infrastructure, the transmission, and so forth. Some of it is private, uh, such as uh, a lot of power generation in most countries. Uh, when it comes to land use, again, mixed public private, public lands, uh, reserve areas, and private farm lands and the need also for public payments for land services or for eco services. The fifth area of urban is heavily uh, local financing of local infrastructure, the roads, the streets, uh, the urban public services, the power lines, the sewerage system, the water. These are largely public, although there can be some private in that. And then finally, when it comes to digital, uh, this has been up to now largely private finance, say by the telecoms companies, but we're not reaching universal coverage. So what the private has been able to do is to expand coverage to two thirds of the world population, roughly but not to the harder to reach part of the world population. I make all of these points to emphasize 
that when we talk about multilateral financing of the SDGs, we have to differentiate by sector and by the type of investor, public versus private, with different weights of public and private, depending on whether it's public services like health and education, private investment like uh, power generation or telecommunications, public financing to help reach those who are not being reached to ensure that, as we say, no one is left behind. Now, what is true in general is that aside from a few rich countries, we have a chronic underinvestment in some or all of these transformations in most countries of the world. In some places like the United States, we're underinvesting because we have forgotten ideologically that government should be doing a lot of investment. We're so anti-government in our politics, so much for tax cuts and anti-government that we basically stopped the public investments a while ago, not because we can't afford them, but because giving tax cuts to rich people became the politics of the United States rather than financing sustainable development. But in middle income and low income countries, the problem is much more structural. If you look at how much it actually costs to provide universal education or universal health care, then budgets of the low income countries cannot close the gap effectively. And so even if they try, they can't finance the SDGs. That's why even before COVID-19, we had major shortfalls. For example, 260 million kids not in school because they are in poor countries where the budgets are inadequate. So we need major structural reforms in financing. I'm gonna end here so that we go to uh, the next uh, panelist, but just to say, in almost all parts of the world, governments need to raise more tax revenues. In almost all parts of the world, we need international tax reform so that multinational companies are accountable for local taxes, not moving money through a, a shell game into tax havens, which they do right now. We need to tax wealth, which we're not taxing. And just to bring you up to date, the richest 500 people in the world, 500, now have wealth of $6.8 trillion. That's 500 people. And they don't pay much, if anything, in tax. And their wealth has gone up by about $700 billion since the start of this year. And just four Americans, Mr. Bezos, Mr. Gates, Mr. Zuckerberg, and Mr. Musk together have $500 billion of wealth. So if we're going to move resources into these six critical transformations, we need new tax system. Uh, we need uh, development transfers uh, of a larger extent. And we're going to need a regulatory environment so that private saving can move into uh, these critical infrastructure areas. This will be the topic I know of uh, many of the speakers on the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you for bringing in the six transformations and explaining the different financing that we need to mobilize those and the different challenges, but also opportunities yeah. for the different transformation. There is a pressing question from the audience, and I will uh, ask uh, the question because it's a perfect opportunity to refer to the 2020 uh, dashboard and index on sustainable of the Sustainable Development Report. Uh, uh, El Hussein and Sam ask, even now we only speak about the goals of SDGs and the risk, but where are the results? Jeff, do you want to quickly respond to this? Uh, half a minute. I would refer to the uh, Sustainable Development Report 2020 and our ability to monitor the progress 
or not in each and every country for each and every goal for each and every time i would say uh, in general uh, in addition to looking at the data which are crucial and looking at real time data as we are trying to do on the website sdgs today uh, we need to understand that even before covid-19 we were far off because we were under investing in these critical areas and especially for the poorer countries because there was an intrinsic financing gap of probably three to 400 billion a year minimum, according to IMF estimates of what was needed, which was not being covered. So we were off track. Now COVID has thrown us wildly off track. This makes all the public investment side harder. We need massive reform globally to bolster budgets of middle and low income countries. It does make capital very low cost in terms of low interest rates right now, so that if we can channel private savings from pension funds and other long-term uh, asset management funds into critical infrastructure, this can make a major positive contribution. Thank you, Jeff. I, I totally agree, and I also uh, like to point that uh, the damages from COVID will be particularly pronounced in countries with weaker health systems, higher levels of debt, less financial space to organize stimulus, pa stimulus packages, less easy access to international liquidity, and so on. So it's also time for solidarity among other things. I will also, I will now move to our uh, next speak. Extremely uh, happy and uh, I call on um, to the floor with great appreciation, Dr. Amadou Diallo, Director of Global Practices, Economic and Social Infrastructure of the Islamic Development Bank Group. Dr. Diallo, do you want to please give us a, a brief update on uh, your efforts with regards to financing the SDGs? Good morning. Can you hear me? Very well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Phoebe and uh, co-chair of the UNSDSN, uh, uh, Prof. Jeffrey Sachs. It's always a pleasure uh, watching you and listening to you talking about uh, um, if passion, the SDGs. Uh, Chief, uh, nice to see you again, Mr. Bernard Woods. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me first thank the organizers for inviting the Islamic Development Bank to be part of this August Assembly to share its experience in providing social development solution and global practices. The bank has been active in socioeconomic development since its inception and has achieved tremendous success over the last four decades and plus in the service of its 57 member countries as well as in other non-member countries. Uh, to achieve the SDGs by 2030, an OSD report titled OECD 2020, how Islamic finance can help achieve the sustainable development goals, found that Islamic finance represent a $2.5 trillion market, a share which could be potentially mobilized for development. Uh, financing SDGs has been estimated between 5 to 7 trillion over the 15 year horizon of the SDGs, uh, with an investment gap in developing countries of about 2.5 trillion every year. Official development assistance flows and all financing by multilateral development bank represent less than 5.5% of the estimated total financing needs. To help countries deliver the SDGs, there is a need to for exploring new approaches of partnership and innovative sources of finance. Indeed, Islamic finance is one of the most important potential sources of development finance that is often, often overlooked. Though Islamic finance is a relatively new industry, it is a growing rapidly and has become a significant financial sector in many countries. Its asset grew at an annual rate of 15 to 20 percent during 2009-2019, and were estimated to exceed 2.44 trillion as of end of 2019. 
Given the huge gaps in finance in the SDGs, it is important to explore the role that Islamic finance can play in promoting wider social and environmental benefit. The basic notion that emanates from Islamic economic principles is that economic activity should meet one's own need and contribute to the good of the society. Indeed, an Islamic economic system would endeavor to eradicate all forms of inequity, injustice, exploitation, oppression, and wrongdoing. From the perspective of society, this implies that an economy should ensure growth and stability with equitable distribution of income where every household earns a respectable income to satisfy basic needs. Commonalities of principle between Islamic finance and sustainable development architecture are striking, as both tend to emphasize ethics, justice, fair treatment, equity, inclusiveness, etc. It is possible to trace the fingerprint of the Quran in each and every one of the SDGs. For example, the Quran expounds the importance of food, water, safety, security, and peace, which are all central to the SDGs. And according to a report by Standard and Pause in 2016, Islamic finance is especially relevant in addressing 12 of the 17 SDGs. The traditional Islamic philanthropy tools and programs such as Zakat, Sadaqah, Waqf in the Islamic finance model and have the greatest role to play in pursuit of many SDGs. This is, of course, in addition to a multiplicity of real asset-based structures that facilitate long-term investment, like Mudaraba, which is profit-sharing and loss-bearing, Wadiha, safekeeping, Musharaka, a cost-plus markup or joint venture, Murabaha, cost-plus, and Ijara leasing. In addition to Takaful, a joint guarantee based on the underlying principle of mutual cooperation and solidarity, an Islamic alternative to conventional insurance to protect and stabilize institutions in the case of financial collapse, and sukuk or Islamic bond. The principle requiring underlying asset in each Islamic financial transaction makes Islamic finance a good equivalent for the financing of infrastructure, which is part of the SDG 6, 7, 9, and 11. Islamic finance can thus be used to increase fund and mobilize donation from a diverse range of sources, including the corporate sector, impact investor, and social entrepreneur. This fund can be used to support the delivery of essential aid during crisis, as well as to provide the more long-term financial support necessary for long-term investment to achieve SDGs. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last four decades, the Islamic Doman Bank Group has successfully pioneered the development of Islamic finance product to fund short and long-term development activities and mobilize resources for infrastructure. These products and services have made a significant contribution to government and private sector entities in financing mega infrastructure projects, as well as micro-level operations in the social sector, such as microfinance for economic empowerment. What makes typical Islamic finance different is its ability to provide innovative product, example, sukuk and green bond that address issues within the real economy. The innovation is not just through the financial product that the IDB has developed, but also through the transfer of knowledge and expertise to address these issues hampering the real economy. This is how innovative Islamic finance can be sustainable by assuring that the beneficiary of the financing understand how to maximize the use of the fund through capacity building. Therefore, the bank lays strong emphasis on the need to announce and provide capacity building so that IDB can evolve from being a bank of development to a bank for developers. Today, to further enhance the promotion of Islamic finance, IDB provides advisory, training, and technical assistance services in addition to the suite of investment and financing options. Ladies and gentlemen, one example of the, of the strong partnership that bridges Islamic finance with the SDGs is the Global Islamic Finance and Impact Investment Platform, which IDB established with the UNDP in 2016. The platform provides market-based solutions to development challenges and position Islamic finance impact investing as an enabler of SDG implementation. Through this platform, UNDP and Islamic Doman Bank jointly produced a report, I for Impact, Blending Islamic Finance and Impact Investing for the Global Goals, in 2017, 
The report articulates the similarities and synergies between Islamic finance and impact investing and thus create an enabling business ecosystem for the SDGs. The partnership also developed an Islamic finance and impact investing training program to help Islamic finance actors to build their capacities to seize SDG investment opportunities. The program was launched in Pakistan in August 2018 and will be replicated in other countries. Through the platform, IDB and UNDP will adopt the seal for commercial Islamic finance to endorse eligible Islamic-based investment aligned with the SDGs. The seal will be operationalized with both the Islamic Finance Council of the UK and the Islamic Research and Training Institute of the Islamic Dominion Bank, as well as the partners of SDGs Impact Platform, which UNDP launched at the UN headquarters in partnership with the Impact Management Program. The seal will help private sector actors and Islamic financiers to identify investable opportunities while measuring the true impact of their intervention on the SDGs. Considering now the potential of Green Sukuk, the global finance, Islamic finance and impact investing platform introduced also a new series of Green Sukuk stakeholder workshop to build a greater understanding of the concept and potential in the renewable energy sector for Islamic financiers. Green Sukuk is a unique example of an Islamic-based impact investment instrument which demonstrates how Islamic finance resources can be utilized toward renewable energy investment. The first Green Sukuk was issued in Malaysia last year to finance a solar power plant. In 2018, UNDP Indonesia worked with the Indonesian Ministry of Finance to support the issuance of their first 1.2 billion sovereign Green Sukuk. In the UAE, the Masjid al Futain on 15 May 2019 marked the listing of the world's first benchmark corporate green sukuk and the first green sukuk issued by a corporate in the region. Valued at $600 million and with a turn of 10 years, the green sukuk will be used to finance and refinance Masjid al Futain existing and future green projects, including green building, renewable energy, sustainable water management, and energy efficiency. The IDB issued its first ever green sukuk in November 2019. The supranational raised uh, uh, 1. 1 billion euro in five-year trust certificate under its 25 trust certificate issuance program. Proceeds from the debut green issuance will be deployed by IDB towards the range of climate change and green projects in its 57 member countries. These include projects for renewable energy, clean transportation, energy efficiency, pollution prevention and control, environmentally sustainable management of natural living resources and land use in sustainable water and wastewater management. The landmark issuance is the first ever AAA rated green sukuk in the global capital market. Last year, on the sideline of the UNGA, the Islamic Dominion Bank and UNICEF launched the first global Muslim philanthropy fund for children. Currently, in need of humanitarian support and help achieve the sustainable development goals. The fund is a unique partnership that will provide new funding resource for humanitarian development program. It will enable multiple forms of Muslim philanthropy, including obligatory giving such as zakat and voluntary giving such as sadaqa, donation and work for endowment to contribute to emergency response and development program. The bank has also uh, been also financing AUKAF uh, endowment, which is a new model of development finance pioneered by the bank with the AUKAF property investment fund. The idea is to finance revenue generating asset whose return will then support various SDGs in a sustainable long-term manner. Indeed, AUKAF finance can help fill the SDG financing gap via attracting private, public, and third sector capital to invest in asset whose return ultimately support the achievement of SDGs. This model of second degree development that is being one degree detached from the developmentally impactful activities of the beneficiary institutions tackles the question of the SDGs financing gap in multiple ways. First, the revenue generating nature of AUKAF project means that in the long term, the decentralized network of endowment financed by APIF will itself act as a source of development resources empowering local development partners. Second, adding arc of project as a revenue generating layer between capital and where it is needed 
opens the door for private investment even where the development activities uh, ultimately being supported are not themselves commercially viable example non-profit work in areas of fragility and conflict or in poor rural areas and third from a charitable perspective alcaf has a unique appeal to donors viewed as a long-term source of impact and legacy many donors prefer this type of vehicle for their larger gift in this way ARCOF can mobilize and capture private domestic savings diverting them towards public uses and transmitting them intergenerationally example of successful uh, ARCOF project in africa include the purchase of an office building in kenya for the benefit of Taufik Trust, which returns supporting needs Somalis in Kenya and Somalia, especially in the areas of education and healthcare. In Senegal, a revenue generating office tower was embedded as part of an educational project as a work to support the post completion operating expenses of the Daras. In Guinea, where after a successful first Alka property built decades ago, the fund is supporting the building of a two 20 story towers to be used for office and housing. The return will be used to finance socio economic activities in the country. In Niame, Niger, the fund has funded the construction of a real estate building to support the Islamic University, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, Islamic finance provides great opportunities, yet he has some challenges that he needs to address for it to grow and reach its full potential. Among those challenges, I will just uh, list a few. Conversation about Islamic finance as the SDGs have tended to be confined to regional conferences held mostly in OSC countries. Although Islamic finance is contributing significantly to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, it is still considered a niche solution and it remains very poorly understood. This potential can only be tapped if there is a strong drive to adopt an appropriate regulatory regime coupled with market and product innovation and diversification. Considering a scale, strengthening the collective ability of various relevant institutions to better leverage Islamic finance will be crucial to offer government a strong non-traditional source of finance to advance towards realizing, realizing the SDGs. Currently, there is a limited information on Islamic finance for development, mainly accounting for the Islamic Roman Bank activities. This explains why the IDB leads the global development community on the use of Islamic finance and is a center of excellence when it comes to development of Islamic financial instrument. The growth of Islamic finance is not currently being utilized to its full potential. It has been witnessed primarily in more economically developed nations, improving the lives of the well-off without equally impacting on those who are less privileged and live in poor areas. Some believe that the ideal core principle of socioeconomic empowerment and support of Islamic finance have been diverted from, and that Islamic finance is not so very different from conventional economic system. As in conventional interest-based finance, Islamic finance still relies on customer credit rating and the ability to repay, benefiting okay. those, those with already good credit. Let so, me conclude by saying that to connect Islamic finance and the sustainable development agenda, a strategic approach is needed to raise awareness among development practitioners. With both its value and modality aligned with the SDGs, Islamic finance represents one of the key means to help achieving the SDGs. Indeed, as I said earlier, Islamic finance can be instrumental in the successful implementation of policy on ending poverty, SDG 1, SDG 2, uh, zero hunger, good health and well-being, SDG 3, good education, SDG 4, gender equality, SDG 5, and promotion of peaceful and inclusive society, SDG 16. All these can be achieved through means such as zakat, sadaka, and fact. I thank you for attention and wish you a successful conference. Thank you, Dr. Diallo. Indeed, I want to repeat what you said. Uh, the Islamic Development Bank does not only want to be a bank for development, but a bank for developers. It is amazing that you are not just uh, producing the financial products, you are also uh, investing in capacity building and empowering people with the strength and ability to march this transition to sustainability. Thank you for all that you are doing. Okay. I
I will now move to our third speaker, Chief, Chief Nathaniel Narsprako. And I excuse, uh, I, I, I apologize for the way I pronounce your name, Executive Director. Chief Nasparco, um, what are the uh, efforts that you are now undertaking uh, towards uh, the achievement, the financing of the achievement of sustainable development goals? And let me also give you a question from the audience to integrate with your speech. Politicians and governments, says Angela Viano, are not responding much to all the warnings for, she means, the non-sustainable path that we are on. She says, I believe we need a change in the way we reframe this and act. Business as usual does not work anymore. And I also agree with her. We need incremental change. We need uh, systemic innovation in order to change from the current pathway to a sustainable one. I remain for your uh, comments and your contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Phoebe. And thank you all, Jeff and uh, my good friend, Amadou and Mr. Wood. I'm so grateful to you all for the opportunity to share with you our practical experiences regarding um, SDG implementation. Um, I'll be glad if uh, you are able to see my slides. Right. So as uh, my good friend um, Amadou indicated, the government goals uh, aiming to end poverty, protecting the planet and ensuring prosperity for all sounds very good. But the critical part is the implementation. For countries to begin implementation of the SDGs, it is critical to build the evidence base for action. A critical component for implementation of the 2030 Agenda will be the decisions taken by each country as it conducts its national SDG implementation planning. So we at MPA believe in harnessing innovation to leave no one behind. We all know that the SDG agenda is hugely ambitious and its successful implementation depends on transformative public services and not just on efficient and effective ones. Sustainable financing is a critical issue that is key to the achievement of the global goals. Indeed, the dependency financing model in which development partners and donors fund such interventions must give way to self-financing options where countries integrate financing for the SDGs into their national budgets. In, at MPA, we believe in strengthening the means of implementation through innovation and partnership. As such, making our innovation inclusive and accessible is our key driver, and we are leveraging on SDG 17 to achieve this. Now, on SDG 1, particularly in Ghana, we have supported the Ministry for Gender and Children and Social Protection with ICT solutions to streamline all the activities of what we call the school feeding program. School Meals has contributed to improve nutrition status of preschool children, primary school children, adolescents, and address macronutrient and micronutrient deficiencies. School Meals can contribute directly to SDG 2, SDG 4, SDG 5, and indirectly to SDG 1 and SDG 8 and SDG 10. This leads to sustainable food production, enhanced nutrition and health, decreased morbidity, and increased learning capabilities. And as you know, we seek to end hunger and ensure access by all people, in particular the poor and the people in vulnerable situations, including infants, to safe, nutritious, and sufficient food. On SDG 2, Goal 2, in Uganda, we had a benevolent organization, um, individual by name Nancy Best, who helped us to 
um, put up what we call a bakery. And in that, in that part, one of the challenges arising from having children in boarding schools has been the availability of educational and other supplies to these children in schools that were assumed to be contributed by their parents who unfortunately cannot afford. In a bid to bridge the gap, Millennium Promise Alliance through dry land integrated development projects identified the bakery as an income generating activity. The bakery was established at Kangoli Girls Senior School as a sustainable income generating activity to bridge the gap instead of relying on external sources for these educational supplies year after year. As a result of this intervention, 20 students and five support staff of Kangoli Girls Secondary School have been fully trained in baking of different products. The cumulative net income of $949 has been realized. The construction of the building has been fully completed, equipping of the bakery with dough mixer, bread slicer, working tables, and baking trays has been achieved. And this, we say the private sector playing a pivotal role in all of this. And throughout our programs, we testify that IDB has been very supportive and has been very instrumental in helping us to achieve most of the things that we have achieved. On goal three, we introduced what we call telemedicine program as a means of helping the deprived communities and health facilities. We established the telemedicine to provide opportunity for patients to access basic health care services without having to travel long distances. It is a financially viable option for patients. It offers health professionals, speeds up emergency referrals, reducing or eliminating unnecessary or inappropriate referrals, and also improving quality of care and help with continuum of health care delivery. Teleconsultations have been established in six regions for national scale. And here, we, what we seek to do is that most professionals, the health professionals refuse posting to hard to reach areas. And therefore they sit in the comfort of their urban centers where we enable them to advance their care through uh, ICT, through telephony, to save the lives of people in the hinterlands where they have refused to go so that these people also uh, get their lives back. We also know that in these hinterlands, their roads are mostly unmotorable. And therefore, it's so difficult for them to travel, pregnant women to travel, to go and assess lab services. Therefore, we introduce what we call the Tropical Lab Initiative, where we establish a laboratory in the rural center at the central point, and then we train phrobotomists to go around to pick lab samples on the same day, and then it is transported to the central point where we have our labs, and then these tests are, are run and then the results are sent through the phones to midwives so that the pregnant women who hitherto used to suffer miscarriages as they ply the unmotorable roads could stay in the comfort of their villages and still receive the care that they so much need. Then on SDG4, in the country, we, um, Ghana, for example, we have indicated development of human capital is very key and it addresses SDG 4, SDG 9 and even SDG 8. And so the government has instituted what we call free senior high school as one of its flagship initiatives. And through this, there has been an increment of enrollment from um, um, over 1.199750 students from 2017 to 2019. This is not limited to arts, business, and science. It's also extended to technical, vocational, and educational training. So MPA played our role in providing what we call the mobile school report card, where we assess the quality of education that is being given. We also supported in the development of policy to provide as a regulatory framework towards the scaling up of the implementation of the mobile school report card nationwide. We have also been collaborating with the Ghana Health Service, Ghana Education Service, and UNICEF on nationwide medical screening of pre-tertiary students in, uh, since 2017. 
and we've been supporting them to ensure that we have the ICT uh, tools to monitor the performance of these students across the country. On goal five, uh, gender equity and ending period poverty. We realize that a lot of these young girls do not have access to menstrual hygiene education and menstrual sanitary products. And therefore, they, they fall prey to young men who try to abuse them. And in the process, um, impregnating them and letting them be absent from classes. And therefore, MPA supported some rural communities to end this period poverty, as we call it, through outreach programs during which donations of sanitary products are made. We plan on uh, helping them to be able to come up with a locally produced sanitary paths that can be much more sustainable in the process. We also educated them on personal hygiene and other gender related issues in Ghana. By so doing, we saw that we, could, we were able to help keep the girl in school and also help to achieve SDG 3 and then quality education in the process. Can I, we have leveraged on. Can I ask you to uh, try to conclude? I know you have uh, probably on each and every SDG amazing results, but we have one other speaker, and your presentation will be available. Uh, right, I'll, do, I'll, I'll wrap up right now. So, um, in a nutshell, what we believe in is that we need to. Uh, as many SDG advocates have planned for 2020 to be an opportunity to remind the world of its commitment to the coming decade. Most governments and organizations are now struggling to make plans for loss of the last six months, let alone the 10 years that is ahead of us. Fortunately, we already have a strong starting point for what the world's economic, social, and environmental outcome should be. As the world eventually shifts its focus from the traumas of 2020 to the needed actions of 2021, we need webinars like this to help inform pathways back to the SDG action. Building the SDG economy needs spending and financing for universal achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. MPA operates in several countries, but funding has prevented us from scaling up many of our innovative SDG interventions convincing countries to incorporate SDG into their national development plans and financing for the SDGs into their national budgets and made political commitment is an area that we need a lot of tax. Thank you very much. That was very efficient and very informative and thank you for the passion and work you put in all of this. I will now call uh, uh, Bernard Woods, Director of Results Management and Aid Effectiveness Division, uh, Strategy, Policy and Review Department of the Asian Development Bank. Mr. Woods, please, your pro the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Phoebe, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, International Conference on Sustainable Development for inviting uh, Asian Development Bank here to share our experience with the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So uh, many speakers have, have talked a little bit about uh, the, the status of the, of, the, uh, of the SDGs. We look at the Asia-Pacific region. We have an excellent partnership with UN SCAP and UN NDP. And the unfortunate uh, fact is the, the progress on the SDGs was off track even before COVID-19. So uh, on none of the 17 goals are we on track in Asia and the Pacific. And now with COVID-19, we're even further uh, off track. So where's the money going to come from? And uh, Professor Sachs uh, talked a little bit about this. Where, how are we going to finance the SDGs? So this is some uh, displaying some work that UNDP has done through uh, development finance assessments, looking at the resources uh, that are going to become uh, or are available for uh, development. Uh, and you can see, for example, the very thin green line on this slide, which is international uh, public finance. So that's all the development finance of the UN multilateral development banks. It's very, very small. And even international private, which is the yellow, is not that large. 
So really the resources to achieve the development goals are gonna come from uh, the countries themselves, from both public uh, and uh, we have to work on taxation as we heard uh, Professor Sachs talking about and private, getting the private sector uh, in Asia and the Pacific to invest uh, in development. So uh, recognizing this, we have a new strategy which was approved in 2018, our strategy 2030, that, that really sees our role as, as, as providing finance and catalyzing finance, but acknowledging even with uh, annual approvals of, of $20 billion a year, this is a very small amount can, uh, compared to the needs of the Asia and the Pacific region. So we need to catalyze more finance, we need to provide knowledge, uh, partnerships, uh, and really work with the, the private uh, sector to do that. And in our strategy, we have seven operational priorities. And these touch very much on the, the transformation areas that uh, the Professor Sachs mentioned. And we've mapped all of them to the sustainable development goals. They include gender equality, of course, uh, goal five, climate change, uh, livable cities, uh, strengthening rural development, governance, institutional capacity development, and these uh, seven operational priorities are really guiding and shaping our, our programs uh, moving forwards. So what does that uh, look like uh, for the, the sustainable development goals with ADB? So we've uh, been able to map our projects to the SDGs. So we have uh, uh, put in place uh, really an industry leading uh, tagging solution, which enables us to, to uh, see how our projects align with the SDGs. No surprise since uh, Asian Development Bank is uh, really primarily uh, funding infrastructure that, that goal nine is, uh, is significantly supported um, along with goal seven, goal 11. A little bit surprising for maybe uh, goal three on health. And part of the reason for this is that goal three includes a, a target on road safety. Uh, so a lot of our transport uh, projects uh, contribute to goal three. Uh, so those are the sector-based goals. We also have a uh, contribution to the thematic goals. Uh, of course, uh, climate action, goal 13, uh, gender equality, goal five, inequality reduction, goal 10, uh, poverty one, uh, and uh, uh, responsible consumption and production, uh, goal 12. And so we also have in each of the countries that we work in, uh, country partnership strategies. So these uh, have had the SDGs uh, linked to them. And then we have specific projects that help to mobilize finance for the SDGs. Uh, one notable is a project uh, uh, in Indonesia. We're working uh, with the Indonesian government on SDG financing vehicle. And then finally, we provide technical assistance uh, to, uh, to realize the SDGs. Uh, for example, we've been working with the government of Kazakhstan, uh, helping them with the, with the national architecture uh, for planning uh, around uh, the SDGs. Uh, let me talk a little bit about a, uh, a particular uh, SDG focused uh, uh, platform. So we heard uh, from the Islamic Development Bank earlier, uh, Dr. Diallo talked about a, a platform they've set up. Uh, we have a, also a, a platform, uh, impact focused uh, venture uh, investment platform looking to crowd in private sector resources uh, specifically for uh, technologies to achieve uh, the SDGs. So uh, clean technology, uh, agriculture technology, uh, finance technology, health technology, and altogether we're aiming to crowd in uh, more than a billion dollars of, of private capital. And so far we have these uh, three pieces of the platform set up, an investment fund, uh, seed fund and also uh, market labs. I should say this is uh, being done in conjunction uh, with uh, Netherlands, uh, Nordic uh, Development Fund, also uh, Korean government and the climate uh, investment funds. So of course we have the, the, uh, the awful situation globally of, of COVID-19 and we can see this uh, really uh, part of the, the tragedy has been our failure uh, on SDG3 to really combat uh, communicable diseases before the pandemic happens. So now we have to focus on achieving the SDGs uh, in the context of recovery from uh, the pandemic and really uh, building back better. And of course, a lot of our response, uh, particular for Asian Development Bank, but also other development actors, has been around responding on health, 
uh, on the on the uh, the fiscal space uh, that governments uh, need uh, to uh, to uh, have uh, various programs for unemployment or to help small businesses uh, survive uh, the pandemic. But really, we need to focus on a green recovery. And as Phoebe, uh, you mentioned, uh, what's coming next is of course climate change. So when we build back better from uh, this pandemic, we need to make sure we're doing it in a low carbon and resilient manner. And really, as Professor Sachs says, we need to put the emphasis on uh, the kind of digital technologies and innovation uh, that, we, uh, that we need to, uh, to really recover in that, uh, in that respect and deliver uh, development results. So let me end a little bit by talking about three things uh, we have uh, moving forwards. Uh, first, we're doing some research. Uh, we're just going to be putting out a call for proposals for partners to help us looking at what are the implications for COVID-19 on the SDGs. Second, we have uh, all of the MDBs and the IMF coming together uh, under the chairship of the Islamic Development Bank, putting together the first uh, MDB report on contributions uh, to the SDGs and Asian Development Bank is uh, supporting that process. And then we're also chairing a, uh, a working group with the MDBs trying to harmonize the way that we count uh, SDG projects uh, and count finance uh, for the SDGs and crucially how we identify projects that will help us uh, to accelerate uh, the SDGs. So uh, maybe I'll uh, leave it there and see if there's uh, uh, any Q&A. Uh, back to you, Phoebe. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much for a concise and powerful uh, communication of what you are doing. It's really a important and a much needed finance can change the world. We need to find uh, the sources of finance and the structure of finance. There is one question that everybody asks, and I want to call Jeff, uh, uh, Jeff Sachs, uh, if he's uh, still with us, uh, to respond. What is the realistic timeline to see SDG implementation? Are we still talking about 2030? Is it possible? Please unmute your mic. Sorry about that. <laughs> the fundamental mistake of the digital age is to leave your mic muted. So I won't do that. Uh, the key, I think, is uh, to avoid simply uh, fitting a line or fitting a curve and saying, this is our trajectory, so this is where we will be in 2030. We actually are in a period where we can do things faster than ever before when we put our minds and our resources to them. The digital technologies are truly universal technologies. If we said and had the backing of uh, Bezos and Gates and Zuckerberg and uh, people with money, if we said every child will have access to online education within a year, this is technically feasible, unimaginable five or 10 years ago absolutely practical now. If we said everybody will have access to telemedicine within a year, this could be accomplished. So the issue actually is our direction and motivation. And our biggest problem, frankly, is the time we lose with our idiot politicians like Trump because it's all distractions. We have a dumb president who knows nothing, and so we can't get organized to do basic things. And this is our big hassle, because it's, you look at what we waste our time with every day, it's not solving these problems. It is talking about some stupid thing a stupid president said, and this is our huge challenge, Phoebe, which is if we took the goals and actually followed through, 
it's no limit what we could do by 2030. And I just want to r remind people, they know it, but it's really true. When I was growing up and I was seven years old, when President Kennedy said, let's go to the moon, he said it in 1961. He said, I believe this country should adopt the goal before this decade is out of sending a man to the moon and returning him safely to the earth. That was 1961. They didn't have computers. They didn't know anything. They had put somebody in space for 15 minutes in the United States. And you know, eight years later, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon and came back safely to Earth. And at that point, NASA's computers had less computing power than this phone. Okay, so if we put our minds to it, we can do this. And I would say to anyone listening in any country, think about this question. How can you get every child in your country online in school? Because it's feasible and they need it right now. So go to the telecoms company, say we need access in the following eight districts of the country. We need curriculum. Go to the teacher's college, build this co coalition and use our digital technologies for leapfrogging in ways that were simply not possible before. In India, by the way, when the geo phone system came in, the Reliance uh, company made geo phones, within a year and a half, 400 million subscribers with data. So let's do something exciting and especially use the leapfrogging possibilities of digital technologies. And then you say, ah, but we don't even have power. Solar panels anywhere can power phones, can power schools, can power clinics. Let's solve the problems. Well, I could not imagine a more inspiring end to this plenary. We have the technology, we have the money, we need the political will. So let's do it. Jeff says it's doable. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>